you so much for joining us. I'm Julia Sutherland and welcome to the first in this new series of Tune Into Tourism Live Interactive Tutorials. Uh, over the next four weeks, we're going to be sharing best practice with you. We're going to be bringing you the latest information on global trends and uh, on a range of topics, all to help you grow your business. Today, we've got an appetite, appetite for food and drink. Um, not just today, but every day. But uh, visitors from near and far really want to get to know a place, to get under the skin of a place. And what better way to do that through our food and drink? Uh, some visitors intentionally seek out these food experiences. Others stumble across them. But for everyone, food and drink is an integral part of the visitor experience. So this week, we are going to be covering everything from provenance to promotion, uh, how to tell the story of your product, uh, create an authentic experience that's so important, that's really the key thing we're talking about today. So we're going to have practical advice on sourcing, storytelling, uh, collaborating with other businesses and we're very lucky to have three live guests today. Uh, we've also got input from a renowned global food expert, uh, Gilly Bashan from her home in the Cairngorms National Park. But live here in the studio today we <coughs> have, first of all, Sandra Reid from Fair Consulting. Sandra, you're very welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, tell us what it is that you do. Hi Julia. Well, Fair Consulting supports businesses to make the most of their food and drink offers. So I work across the UK, but a lot in Scotland, and I kind of specialise in food, in tourism and heritage attractions. So I, I started my career in, um, in an independent restaurant, so I've always worked in, in, in restaurants and um, kind of specialised in museums, and uh, heritage attractions. So I think it's really, really important that these places where the heart of our tourism is has a really good food offer. Absolutely. And you're just back from Ireland as well, I think, finding I out more about this very yes. topic. Um, so beginning of October, I was in Ireland with the Ayrshire Chamber of Commerce and we were on a learning journey, which was very, very much fun as well as learning. But I think the Irish are possibly a little bit ahead of us in terms of their food tourism strategy and their food tourism journey. It's very joined up, there's lots of collaboration and you know, without exception the businesses that we saw were promoting provenance and were all on board with the, the one message <coughs> approach. And it was really working for them. Well, we'll find out more about that a little bit later on. We're also delighted to be joined by award-winning uh, restaurateur, that's not the right word, Karina <laughs> Montini. Karina, you've got three Edinburgh City Centre restaurants and tradition and taste are very much at the heart of what you do, aren't they? Yeah, well, my husband and I, Victor um, Contini, yeah, I'm married to Victor Contini. <laughs> we started 15 years ago, although our family have been um, sharing the fabulous Scottish larder with our fabulous friends around Scotland for a hundred years almost. Um, so in, in Edinburgh we're very lucky to have three key venues at the National Gallery of Scotland, up at, the, up at Cannibal near the castle and on George Street, where our whole philosophy has been I suppose to bring the, the best that we can bring. Originally it was from Italy, you know, we wanted to source from Italy because we're Italian background. Um, and then over the years we realised actually Scotland's got so much to offer. Why are we going to Italy when we can actually just open our back door or walk along the road and actually the food's there. So, I mean, the Scottish larder and the seasonality has, um, has really driven our business to where it is today. Um, and we're, we're just so proud of, of the, the partners through our suppliers and through the producers you know, what nature actually gives us as well. Nature gives us so much mm -hmm. and we've got to thank nature and look after it so it's there for the next generation. Absolutely, and that is this, it's this fabulous resource that we have right under our noses and how we can be making more of that. Well, we're also later on, we're gonna be talking to um, uh, Scott Fraser. We've got him joining us live here. He's a global food trend analyst with foodpeople.com. Uh, uh, but most importantly, we want you to ask your questions. You are as much a part of this interactive tutorial as our guests are. Uh, and so we've got Richard, who's going to be in the chat box, monitoring all your questions and comments. Richard. Thank you, Julia. Yes, hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be back uh, doing the thing that's not the W word anymore. Um, and thanks for watching. And already people are getting involved in the chat box. So morning to Carol. Amy's here. Laura's here as well. We've got Emma in Kintyre and Lee Ingster, who's, 
Yes, the video has started, Lee. Um, just click the refresh button in the corner and you should be all up and running. Um, so any questions that you've got, anything that's relevant to your business or anything that you want to know or any examples of best practice or anything like that, do get involved in the chat box and I will be able to put those questions to the panel and share those points with you. So I uh, look forward to hearing from as many of you as possible. And do let us know where you are. Where are you watching this morning? Um, where are you? What business do you run? And um, we'll share that around and um, get a little bit of a chat going. So anyway, Julia, back to you. Yes, it can get very lively in that chat box and that's exactly what we want. But why is this so important? Well, food tourism is no longer just about niche culinary experiences sought out by dedicated foodies, um, but it's about regionally relevant food and drink offerings which provide something appealing for every occasion, every budget and every taste. It's for every visitor that comes here, it's, it's going to be relevant for them. 20% of visitors spend after you take out accommodation and travel is on food and drink. So it's a huge part of, of the money that's sw swilling around from these visitors. Um, and so th this can mean all sorts of different things. It's uh, looking for memorable drink eating and drinking experiences. It can be you know, trying food at a local restaurant. It can be visiting a whiskey distillery, uh, going on a beer trail, a food festival, street fair, uh, or even an agricultural event, uh, taking a cookery class or visiting a farm. Um, lots of different things that really encompasses um, and, and you know it's all about when people are away from home authenticity and diversity are key so Sandra this is beyond a trend isn't it people really want an experience absolutely this is this is something that is here to stay um, food is so much part of people's lives you know you, you mentioned the the stats of uh, you know the, the visitor spend on on food and drink I think we have to remember there's 14 million visitors to Scotland and every one of them will eat and drink because we have to. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think the stats are something like 92% of visitors to Scotland will go to a restaurant, a cafe, um, some sort of food experience, a bar. Um, I assume the, the other 8%, you know, perhaps just go, diet. Go, <laughs> or go to a supermarket. And yeah. hopefully there they will, uh, they will also be buying, uh, buying Scottish food. So, yes, it's absolutely here to stay. Yeah, and well, you, it has to be experiential. It really does, and you know, you mentioned the the um, the statistics there. We've actually got um, a little bit. You can go and find that visit Scotland research. Uh, there's a lot more statistics in there. Um, but uh, some of the things that came out of that research were that there was a gap in their expectation and what was actually delivered, and a positive one. So yes. visitors were coming expecting things not to be as good as they actually were. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe a sign that we're not selling ourselves. We're selling Absolutely. ourselves short, perhaps a bit there. Mm -hmm. And the other opportunity you see there uh, was that perhaps we could be making more of our local produce so you know the the information is out there you should definitely go and check that out I think Richard can put the link into the chat box as well so you can have a look at that but um, you, there's also uh, uh, Karina you know the, the local produce side of things where we do have that gap that's such an important part of what you do isn't it I mean the Scottish cafe I mean, we chose the name the Scottish cafe 10 or oh, 10 11 years ago now the fact that that name the Scottish cafe and the Scottish restaurant were available to buy on you know, our, our www dot domain name. I think we bought them for two pounds fifty or something. You know, wow. I think it, uh, it captured a moment that people actually didn't value that connection between food and and our and our place. Mm -hmm. You know, www dot Italia dot it um, Italia cafe or Italy cafe or something that would have gone in Rome years and years <laughs> yeah. ago or in France, but here we hadn't really embraced it, and I think once. Once everybody sort of, I think p p domestically, you know, we've maybe been shy about our food, yes. you know, and we, whether it's the supermarkets to blame, we all, we, you know, we blame the supermarkets for everything, um, whether it's just technology, you know, the microwave, the freezer, um, or just people working in a different way, and we stopped cooking as much as we did. And I think when that trend and and everybody going out to a restaurant started to happen. You know, it's happened over the last hundred years, but it's probably happened slightly slower mm -hmm. here than maybe throughout the rest of Europe. Um, and when, when we stopped cooking, I think there was that gap of, oh, where do we get our food? And then when, the, when we realized it was there, it was an incredible revelation, you know? And, mm -hmm. you know, traveling around Scotland 10, 15 years ago, you, you would be struggling to find some good food. Now we've got some of the best you know, whether it's Michelin starred or, or best attractions, you know, Lonely Planet Guide up in uh, Stonehaven, wherever it is, you know, we've got amazing um, drivers for people to actually come and visit and experience the mm -hmm. food that's 
on our doorsteps. Well, as you say, it's that experience, it's that word that just keeps popping up and it's tying together the food and drink with our tourism offering. And you may have seen the uh, Food Tourism Action Plan, uh, which was published in August. Um, Al, I think we can have a wee look at that. Uh, it uh, is the shared vision of Scotland Food and Drink and the Scottish Tourism Alliance. And the goal there is to take the nearly £1 billion pounds that visitors already spend on food and drink in a year and by 2030 uh, double that. So turn that into two billion pounds, which is a you know a, a worthy goal, I would say. Um, so yeah, it's worth checking that out. Richard uh, can share the link to that as well in the chat box, so you can have a wee look at that. Um, but Sandra, you know, talking about sh selling ourselves short, what do you think tourism businesses can do? What's a simple step to maybe narrow that gap of expectation versus the reality? I think that Scots are kind of naturally self-deprecating mm -hmm. and uh, you, we need to get over ourselves in that respect. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, there are, there are some very, very simple uh, things that you can do if you take a look at your menu and just have a, have a long, hard look at it and say, you know, what, what am I selling here? And if, if you have a very sort of simple explanation under a, uh, against a dish, can you name the supplier? Can, is there a story there? Um, where did that recipe come from? Um, where is the where is the the origin of that food? Let's let's bring let's look at the provenance and let's shout about it. Mm -hmm. We really need to shout about these things, and we haven't been doing that. Um, Karina does it very well, and it's it's quite challenging, I think, to to some businesses to do that, but. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know it's just it's a simple steps of simple step. look, look 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 at your suppliers where does your food come from get help from your suppliers your, your suppliers are absolutely amazing um, it's all about collaboration and um, talking to people what help can you give me can you can you let me know where this food where was my fish landed um, tell me the story of that so that I can put that on my menu. So you don't necessarily need to be doing anything particularly different, it's just how you c yeah. convey what you're already doing to mm -hmm. your to your visitors, mm -hmm. maybe some little tweaks, just bringing to life mm -hmm. that what's on the plate a little bit more. Karina, obviously that's something that's very important to you, you're you're not just writing about it, you're physically showing ingredients to, to your visitors, aren't you? Uh, I think on your point is, it's, when, I mean, when we started we thought actually buying Scottish would be more expensive, but if you actually, I mean, case in point, you know, halibut is one of the most expensive fish that you can buy. But if you're buying halibut in season, it can actually be cheaper than cod. It's understanding the seasonality of what we're growing, you know, and I, I'm amazed. I, I, you know, you're going to a supermarket and they've still got Scottish strawberries just now, and they're the same price as the Scottish strawberries were in June when it was sort of peak season. Mm -hmm. But you know, they're they're using heated polytunnels and actually the flavour isn't there. We've got to connect with the seasonality. So and if we connect with the seasonality we'll actually be able to use brilliant ingredients that are actually quite cheap. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you can be then you can invest in your team. Mm -hmm. And if you've invested in your team, then your team can then invest in the customer journey. They can spend more time, they can share the story of where the mussels have come from, or share the story of where the honeys come from. Or, um, and I think there, there's so much, um, but there's so much pressure on, on businesses. You know, Edinburgh has got more restaurants per capita than any other city in the UK, even more so than London. So the competition is massive. Um, we need to be able to feed the whole of, you know, in, in terms of our tourism, we need to be able to feed the whole of the the whole of Scotland and that's one of the things that we felt really really passionate about you know buying from Stornoway or buying from Orkney or buying from um, Rothsey you know you need to be able to spread the love of, yes. mm -hmm. of the volume of what we're buying so some of our visitors are coming they're coming from America they're doing Europe in three days they're coming to Scotland they may go to St Andrews for a game of golf but they're not getting to do the full tour others do um, but for the ones that don't get the full tour, I think it's our responsibility in the, in the key city hotspots to actually be bringing the food to them. Mm -hmm. You know, and if that is, you know, whichever suppliers we're bringing our, our, our Mara seaweed or whatever, you know, we've got to bring the food to them. Mm -hmm. Well, that is, a, that is a great point because that's businesses in the Highlands and Islands don't necessarily need to be thinking 
sort of micro-local. They can be thinking about Scotland as a whole and telling the yes. story of not just their specific area, but bringing ingredients from other parts of Scotland and making the most of that. Because as you say, visitors are maybe not just, um, they're not going to get a chance to travel all the way around yeah. and experience everything in their local spots, but you can bring that to them. Yes. You can do that too. Let, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about this. Uh, Richard, are there any, any comments coming in in the chat box? Um, we've got a few comments coming in in the chat box, mainly people just saying hello and that they're watching from Milan in Italy. <laughs> very generous. Ciao. Laura in Milan. And we've got um, Karen who's in Padua in Italy. So um, I've said um, buongiorno to them, very pleased with myself. Um, and I'm just mostly sharing links, so do keep getting in touch. I've, so far I've just been sharing links of things that you've been talking about and typing spread the love. Um, so I think it would be useful. There's, I know that there's plenty of you watching, so do get in touch with any points. That go, oh, we've got another Richard here from Stornoway, um, and he's interested in how we can collectively market our fabulous Hebridean produce. So that's where we are just now. So back to you, Julia. Well, that, that is sort of something that we, we were just talking about there, that collective effort. Yeah. Uh, so how can individual businesses do that? Because I'm thinking about people who are watching just now who run maybe a small tourism business mm -hmm. somewhere, you know, some remote spot gone. How can they be part of that collective effort? I would suggest that um, if you don't have a food network in your area, that you start to look at creating one. Scotland Food and Drink will support um, food networks to, um, to, to get going. Um, there's also a fund through um, Connect Local, mm -hmm. uh, which I think we'll post details of later. It's called the Regional Food Fund, and they are offering grants of up to 5k for um, regional food activity. For collaboration. Uh, for colla it? it's, it's for collaborative, specifically for collaborative activity. You know, I would I would urge you just to just to speak to other businesses. Um, people are very willing to share. I think the days of um, yes, we are we are in competition with each other, but we also need to collaborate. Mm -hmm. So, so we've talked a little bit about sourcing, about having that communication with your suppliers, so that you can tell the story and they can help you to do that. You're helping one another about telling the story of Scotland's food, not just your local food. But how do, how do you actually tell the story, Karina? What is the how do you go about doing that? What's your interaction with your visitors? We've got we've got 130 boys and girls. I can't believe it. I mean, it's uh, the, the, our team is, has just grown enormously because um, we we know we need to invest in the experience side yes. of it. You know, the service. When when we first started, it was all about the product, buying the very best that we could, and we didn't connect that all the way through to the final journey. You know, and we we couldn't understand why. Um, you know, there was a mis misconception between the, um, the price that we were charging and the visitor's response mm -hmm. because we weren't communicating because we hadn't resourced enough and, and given enough time to the team to tell the story of what the products were. Because once you understand what the product is and you understand the effort that's gone into finding that or sourcing that or growing it, I mean, Humphrey Errington is a perfect example. You know, we've changed our cheese board in our Italian restaurant to be 100% Scottish because we feel it's our, our cheese suppliers in Brayways have stopped, will stop producing very shortly. One of a, a, an award winning um, cheese from the West Coast. Humphrey Errington's have gone through tremendous troubles over the last um, two years. Thankfully, they've won their case and we can eat Coraline <laughs> and Lanark <laughs> Blue. Um, but we felt it was really important to, to share their story because they need us. But mm -hmm. we need to be able to share the story. So training is becoming more and more important for us. I mean, last week we did five training sessions with our teams across the three venues, whether that's cheese training, we're work, working with Ian Mellis now, because um, you know we, we do buy direct wherever we can, but because training is so important, I can't get the reeds to come down from Mull, and I can't get up to Mull to train the team you know, that's just not practical in terms of everybody's work-life balance. Mm -hmm. So I need to be able to tap into a supplier that's closer at hand, you know, and so buying through a cheesemonger is something that we've never done before, but from a training point of view, we felt that that was necessary. So training, we've got um, kombucha, and that wonderful fermented tea, they're coming in to do a training next week. We had Belveni last week, um, tasting a 35-year-old malt that had never been tasted before yeah. um, so tr training is it just gets the team engaged it gets them um, excited you know and Megan at Cannonball she won a, a trip up to 
up to Skye. She got to eat at Three Chimneys. She'd never been there before as part of, I think it was through Hit Scotland. I can't remember, I think it was Hit, Hit Scotland. Um, and with Anya at, at Continue George Street. So the, the two of them went up there and then they went to Drambu. They want every cocktail, they want every drink to have Drambu in it. Yeah. You know, the suppliers know the value. If they can connect with our team, then they will get a better uh, sales return on that. Yeah. But then the visitor understand, gets the story and understands and engages. I mean, it's, it just adds... The people are passionate anyway, but when they've got the knowledge, it gives them the confidence. And then it's, sell, it's selling without even thinking about it. And that's, I think, the success of it. You can sell with knowledge without having to sell in a fear space. Because if you're frightened about something, you run away from it, so you're not engaged. Mm -hmm. um, and then the customers just appreciate. And, and, and some customers don't want to know. I mean, I think we've got to acknowledge that as well. Some people are not interested. So you've got to respect that and mm -hmm. have the knowledge to say, OK, I'm not going to bore this customer <laughs> to tears on this particular product. But the majority of people do want to know, they want to understand where it's come from, the provenance. They are prepared to pay more when they understand where it's come from and the people that are involved with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been a, a boom in chain restaurants in the city. Mm -hmm. and, and so far, the feeling that I'm getting from, as you said, we're collaborating more, the feeling that I'm getting from the independents are that they're able to hold their heads up because they are selling a local story or a story that's got a history and a connection. And that's what the visitors want to buy into. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you mentioned the Three Chimneys there. The Three Chimneys have done a brilliant job of becoming really a destination and so Absolutely. connected with a place and, and that pr provenance premium. You know, people prepare to pay a bit more to have that special experience. How, what can we learn from that? What can smaller businesses that maybe don't, aren't necessarily doing something that's so high end, what can they learn from, from what Three Chimneys have achieved? There? From connecting with place. Yeah. I think it's about, it's about understanding your, your landscape. When, when I was in Ireland um, a few weeks ago, uh, a lot of the businesses that we visited were along the Wild Atlantic Way. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic scenery and all of the businesses were uh, bought into that engagement with, um, with the route. Um, with the scenery along the route, with the signposting along the route. And, you know, I think it's, it's as well as understanding your supply chain and your food offer, it's also understanding that you're a tourism ambassador. Um, so if, if, this, if staff, uh, whether it's in a cafe or a bar or a high, uh, you know, sort of high level restaurant, as long as they understand um, that they are, they're part of tour uh, Scotland's tourism product, and they need to understand a bit about, uh, about the region mm -hmm. as well as, as, as the product itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes down to, um, to training, mm -hmm. to staff training. And you were talking about training yourself so they can tell the story. Can you give us a wee example of this sort of thing? I think you brought some products in. There's a, an olive oil there. Do we, or, oh, okay, there's some honey too. Can you can tell us, give us an example of how you sort of sell um, one of your products and tell the story and the, the history and the culture? Well, this is... It. Victor's your good honey. Right. Okay. There's a there's a wee connection. If anybody can spot what the connection is, I will send them a jar of honey. How about that? Okay. Okay. I'll, if you can spot the connect, your good honey. Um, so we have a one acre kitchen garden where we yeah. grow our produce for our restaurants. Um, Bryony's our gardener at the moment. She's doing a fantastic job. Victor's in the garden this morning with Bryony because the leaf damage because of the winds is horrendous. Um, that's that's actually another amazing journey for us because we, by growing your own produce, you understand how how much luck's involved in nature, how much time effort is involved, um, and how how little or abundant harvests can be and it makes you appreciate what's coming out of the ground which yeah. is that that's been an incredible journey for us but this is Victor's honey so Margaret helps uh, Margaret Forrest who she's one of Victor's beekeepers because they're um, they've both got their um, Scottish Beekeepers Association accreditation and um, so we have six hives two at the gallery modern art and four <coughs> in the garden um, and this the quality of the honey this year is absolutely exceptional I mean, it is just beautiful. So we've always had the comb honey. So in each of the restaurants, you'll see the combs, the frames coming out of the hive. We use that, um, we use it in burrata, we use it on our cheese board, and um, we'll use it um, with some of our desserts. So the team are actually seeing the comb, the actual comb that comes out of the hive, and they'll see um, 
they'll see how nature has created mm -hmm. this product and then obviously we're, we're spinning it, we're, we're taking it out and then jarring it. Um, and so the, the team get to taste it and we'll use it specifically. So this product we will use specifically in its container. Because mm -hmm. if we decant that into another dish or onto a plate, sometimes it's lost yes. and you don't have the time to explain the story. But today, table one, a lovely gentleman comes in for his porridge mm -hmm. um, and he had um, porridge, I can't remember what it was called, berry porridge. But we give him the jar of honey on the table with the honey dipper mm -hmm. so he can see that. So the team will say, this is Victor's honey. Mm -hmm. And it all it's connects. And it all connects. Through. That's fantastic. So you need some props. I think props yeah. are really mm -hmm. important. You know, yeah. and it's labelling and telling the story in, in yeah. at every every stage of the of and the, the food props journey. give the team the confidence to engage. Yes. Without this, it's almost like you know, I suppose they're on stage, they're acting. You know, they mm -hmm. need a, mm -hmm. they need something to help them articulate. Yes, yeah, it does help. Yes. Well, we've got some um, examples of some other businesses that I want to show you. Uh, Richard, you're waving at me. Is there something you wanted to add at this point in time? Well, I've always wanted to get involved, uh, <laughs> you know, so, but just wanted to sort of say that people are really enjoying a lot of stuff that what you're um, talking about today. Um, Karen was just saying that she runs a pop-up restaurant um, from her home in Inverness and um, she's well aware of the seasonality of products and always tries to source very re uh, tries to source locally uh, and seasonally as much as she can. Katie was asking, wondering if, like the businesses that you run, if, if you ever sort of recommend to people, tourists who come in, if you ever recommend visits to food producers or distillers or anything like that. So if you want to answer that question. Sure, so yeah, and how much are you promoting other businesses or suppliers or you know any other? I think the menu is a very easy place to, to promote, promote suppliers. I think in, in the sector that I work a lot in, in visitor attractions, um, that's a, it's very often the case that if you've got, a, for example, honey on the menu, you might, you might also sell that in your visitor shop and you might also uh, tie up with the, the supplier to have visits to um, visits uh, as part of the, the tourism experience. Mm -hmm. I think it's happening more and more. Um, it just needs to be a little bit more joined up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you, you refer to any of your well, suppliers. We have, we've always had our map at the Scottish Cafe. So mm -hmm. you walk in the door and we've had that massive easel. And I must admit, a lot of people have now got the map, which is brilliant because yes. it's sharing the story. But I mean, we, we did the map and Alice, who does our artwork, she actually lives half of her life in New Zealand, <laughs> half of her life in Scotland. Huh? Um, and every time she comes back from New Zealand, she comes in and she'll update the map and she re-signs it with the date. Because unfortunately, you know, we do lose some of our producers. You know, Cuddy Bridge, an amazing apple juice, you know, the most beautiful, beautiful apple juice, pressed apple juice. Um, he couldn't afford to keep making that product because people can't weren't prepared to pay three or four pounds or five pounds mm -hmm. for a glass of orange juice or uh, sorry, apple juice. Um, so the, you know, the, the map is there and, and it's, it's living and breathing, you know, so if you get a new supplier, it's a wonderful thing to be able to add that new supplier onto the, onto the map. map and then again, mm -hmm. it's a tool for the team, come and, see our new, come and see our new supplier or go and visit them. I mean, the tourists that take the photograph of that map, because you know, coming to Edinburgh, you're in Princess Street Gardens, not enough people appreciate how far away Stornoway yes. or Shetland is, mm -hmm. and thankfully we're not we're not in the box anymore. No, no more boxes. No more boxes. Shetland's out its box. <laughs> well, listen, this is I'm just aware that we're running out of time, and I do want to share um, uh, some more advice with you. Uh, on Monday, Richard and I actually travelled to meet someone who is just a one-man band, a one-man business, or one-woman band rather. But she had loads of great advice to share. So uh, take a look at that now. Well, I'm Gilly Bashan, and I'm primarily a writer and broadcaster, but I also do a lot of catering from my kitchen, which is where we are right now, in the Cairngorm National Park, up a shooting uh, track, so it's extremely remote. Lots of international people come here to my house and to a whiskey barn that I have out in an old barn outside. Um, and we do a lot of foraging together, we do a lot of tasting, pairing of food, often local produce as well as forage produce with um, whiskey.
A lot of my clients are international and it's nice to be able to give them something that's from here and it kind of goes along with the whole tourism side. You know, you're able to give them whiskey from here, the produce from here. And my background is in different cultures, so I actually do dishes that um, will draw or be inspired by different cultures, but I'm always using the local produce. The, the, the most popular thing I do is in the spring, actually, um, spring and early summer when we have wild garlic, and I pick the, the wild garlic leaves and steam them and then wrap the haggis within them to make a little, what's called a dolma in the, in the Middle East or in Turkey. And you make this little package, basically, within these steamed garlic leaves so the flavour goes through the haggis as well and then I just finish them off with some ghee and mustard seeds and pop them in the oven and and people just keep popping them they just love them. I do I like the idea of you know sort of the land to the plate um, you know using as much as I can even if it's only in a dressing you know just somehow bringing the land into what we're doing and again when I'm doing food with whiskey that's important because you need to show people the flavours that actually go into the water through the soil and then that starts off the whole flavour spectrum within whiskey. I know it's very minute you know the majority of flavour in whiskey comes from the barrel the cask that it's uh, maturing in but um, but the water is terribly important too. They love your personal stories you know if you've got stories of what your granny did or or somebody local some old person in a village or whatever they love those kind of stories and then when it's related to whiskey anything to do with um, you know illicit stills and and smugglers and excise men and always the the sort of the, the croft is getting the better of the excise men that's always the popular one um, now collaboration is really important for me for one I'm just a, a one-woman band and and I have fingers and lots of pies so um, I, I have to keep the momentum going so to actually have joined forces with uh, the whiskey industry means that I've got a much more reliable source of income, but also a more reliable source of client, which means I can always think of new ideas and try to think of ways of making their whole experience interesting. The biggest thing that I've learnt um, working within the tourism industry is actually how little you need to make people kind of have an unusual experience. Um, and that's, that's been hugely important to me. I always thought I was going to have to spend a lot of money to do up a barn, to, to invest in all sorts of equipment, to, to, to make people happy and have a, a, an amazing experience. But actually, it's been completely the opposite. I mean, for a start, Scotland is, you know, such a stunning country. I live in a stunning location. So already, I'm, I'm starting on a win-win situation because I've got the environment. The rest is, it has to come from within. So, you know, you've got to love people, you've got to love sharing what you've got, and you've got to understand what hospitality really means. And hospitality isn't just about giving somebody a nice meal and then a bill. You know, hospitality is about sharing. I don't need to invest a lot. What I actually have, which is just my simple home, is actually enough. And that's what people want. They want that experience to come in, to meet you, to be in your environment, to um, experience your way of life. And my way of life is a wee bit unique. So that completely uh, seems to blow people's mind. And, and, and they do always leave kind of feeling like they've either been inspired or enriched or just had a lovely experience. Gilly Bashan there um, from her home in the Cairngorms National Park, a beautiful spot where she has lots of guests coming to do cookery courses, she does pairings with whiskey um, and as you heard her saying there it's actually not about spending lots of money and um, it's about what you've already got so sharing yourself and hospitality is about sharing. Sandra we're going to uh, swap you out for Scott in a second but before you go what would you say your, your number one top tip would be for tourism businesses to improve what they're doing in terms of their food and drink offering? I think the one thing I would say is don't be shy don't be that self-deprecating, Scott, and please find others to collaborate with. Right, well, thank you very much. That's excellent. Yeah. We're going to swap you around, and whilst we do that, Richard, can we go back to you, and, uh, and are there any other questions coming in in the chat box? Um, thank you. Yeah, there are a few questions coming in, but also just a lot of comments, really, of people who are sort of absolutely agreeing with some of the stuff that you're, you're saying. One of the subjects that seems to be really resonating um, with people watching is this kind of concept of storytelling and sort of sharing this information. Um, so Emma, uh, who has got the Kintyre 
gin. They make Kintyre gin, which sounds amazing. And is that... I know it's not quite an invitation for a distillery tour, mm. but we'll work on that. Um, but they said that they've started doing distillery tours and they've turned out to be more popular than they could ever imagine. And um, we've also had uh, Richard Jones just get in touch. And he's saying, look, this is really, he runs, uh, he runs Farmer Jones Academy, which is based in Nairn for its training and inspiring youngsters to get into the business of food and drink and farming. So he's finding this incredibly inspiring for them. And then we've also got Natalie, who just backed up. I'm sure there's some of you watching who saw our Facebook live session yesterday and just backing up she's a French translator but says that the French visitors and French tourists you know really particularly the French you know gas gastronomique um, they really do crave for seasonal organic and homemade products linked to stories um, very much so uh, uh, and there's something else. oh that's something we'll get back to that later but yeah that's it for now but um, certainly the storytelling idea of food is really resonating with people so Julia back to you Yes, absolutely. I do think that's probably the key thing from everything that I've been looking at it's, is that's one of the best ways really to connect with people, to engage with them. It is about a personal experience. And you maybe remember we went to the Dunnett Bay Distillery um, and they were talking uh, when we did the North Coast 500 last year and they talked about how actually having those visitors coming to visit the distillery and the shop, they were able to extend the season. So people are really interested in that and I'm hoping that we can turn that almost offer into a visit to the distillery, into a real one. Please, thank you very much. Um, OK, so uh, we're joined now. Uh, Sandra's been swapped out, and we have Scott Fraser. Scott Fraser, Global Food Analyst, Food Trend Analyst, yes. Anna, 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 Analyst. <laughs> it's a very fancy title. Uh, yes, that's the gin already. Exactly. Yes, I know you'd think it'd be known it. Um, so tell us what it is that you do, Scott. Yes, I'm very lucky to have one of these jobs that have got all these crazy titles. So I'm a, a trends analyst. I spot food trends around the globe. And we, we tend to instruct big business uh, on what the new food trends will be, but I pretty much spend my life looking, reading, and writing about food each day, mm -hmm. which is really exciting. Yeah, and your background, you have also been a, a chef as well. You've got your Yeah, I managed to get out of the kitchen, so <laughs> I was a chef for 20 years, and then after that, for five years, I designed meals uh, for a fish company for M&S and various retailers, so I've got a little bit of a commercial background. And I was lucky to work in some of the, the Highlands' most beautiful places. I worked in a shooting lodge up in the Cairn Gorms, and you know, some of the produce, like the grouse and the chanterelle, fantastic. And I was lucky to spend a year with Shirley Spears up at the Three Chimneys, mm -hmm. and that has some of my most great fantastic food memories, you know, mm -hmm. watching the guy um, on his mobile phone saying, this is your langoustines coming in, and you're looking out the window, seeing him on the boat, and it landing, me driving my old polo sport down to the, the harbour, grabbing these amazing langoustines, which were, were just fighting away. Literally just out the water. Into, mm -hmm. into a pan, onto, onto the plates. And Couldn't be more connected. Food doesn't get better than that globally. Yeah, well that, uh, that is exactly what people are looking for, isn't it? That's yeah. what the, the trend is. People are looking for authenticity and unique yes. food experiences. Can you, can you give us some examples of, of that? Yeah, exactly. The, one of the things I was listening to when um, uh, Sandra and Sunil were talking about uh, food and people, I think food is often or often much more a product of the people and the place. It's a joining of the two. One of my favourite stories of, is of Barry Graham who's a, a cheesemaker down in Dumfries and Galloway at Loch Arthur. And he creates this amazing cheddar cheese. And when he, he started making it, what was really important in his community was the lunch break. And when he put the rennet into the, into the cheese, there was a certain amount of time that you needed to leave the rennet before you then strained off, strained off the curds and made your cheese. But that time hit right in the middle of his, his lunch. But he said, do you know what I'm gonna do? We're just gonna leave him a bit longer so we can finish our lunch. Right. And then mm. they made this cheese. Now, it went against all of what the, the, the cheese uh, cheddar making uh, ideals would be. But he created a unique story that, that was just a product of what he wanted to do. So it was a, a product of the people. His lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was a product of the people and the people who were making it, which is really important. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other really interesting stories about um, the food. And I think we can learn from other places. And, and the two places I would really highlight, one would be San Sebastian and they're probably one of the most gastronomically incredible food tourist destinations. And the other one that's really driving a lot is Singapore. Right. Now, how does a, a, a tiny little landlocked sort of a city resonate with Scotland? Well, they've got 5.5 million people similar to us, and they're really excited about creating food tourism. So there's a lot of interesting things which are happening there. Mm -hmm. So where can we go to maybe get be inspired, inspired. by that? Inspired. 
One of my favourite ones, and it kind of resonates with the Scottish experience, is this restaurant called El Cano in San Sebastian. And they're just along the coast from San Sebastian, a tiny little village. And what they do is they've become experts in one thing. They've become experts in grilling fish. You may have seen Thomas Parry at Brat in London. He's sort of doing some amazing things. He was inspired by this restaurant. They've been going for 30 odd years. And what they do is they take turbot from the Bay of Biscay. And the Bay of Biscay is one of the most uh, rich oceans around because the water comes up from deep into the Bay of Biscay. And you catch the best fish there is. And all they do is they grill it on coals on the street with lemon and olive oil. And that's all you get. That's their restaurant. They've become experts in one thing. And I think that's often what we could learn from other businesses. If you can keep it simple, take the ingredients that we've got, and we know they're the best ingredients in the world. They get shipped off and, uh, mm. to, the to, problem, to Spain. Yeah. When I worked in Spain, I was you know, cooking Scottish Langstains and, and mussels for, you know, it was about 170 you know, euro a kilo for our, our Langstains. Can you imagine if you got some Langstains, grill them over some you know, peat embers, Mm-hmm. Put them into a, into a vat with a bit of you know wild garlic Lunch mayonnaise. Lunch time, simple, 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 simple <laughs> yeah. stuff. So these are interesting things I think we can learn. Mm-hmm. And you can, you've obviously got a huge passion for it, and that mm-hmm. comes across. And that's what we're trying to do, isn't it? Convey yeah. that passion. I wanted to just talk about um, the importance of of online and how mm-hmm. we tell the stories online. So obviously yeah. there's Instagram which is becoming a huge, because it's such a visual platform, mm-hmm. and a really great way to sell our food. What, what, what are your thoughts on, on how mm. we can use Instagram better? I, I, Instagram is a key in food now. It's, it's got to the point that Instagram is even changing food. You know, we, we wouldn't have had these freak shakes and bubble wrap ice creams if, and uh, avocados. <laughs> if it wasn't for Instagram. That said, there are some, the, 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 these are slightly detrimental parts, but the positive parts of Instagram is that it gives people a shop window into your, into your, your restaurant, your food. It creates hype. It creates a want and a desire for, for the food that you're producing. Some of the best people I see do, doing it, a guy called Tom Brown, he's got a restaurant called Cornerstone down I think we've in... Actually got, uh, I think we can show you some of uh, Tom Brown's Instagram. Yeah, yes. and he's an amazing guy. He was trained with uh, Nathan Outlaw down in Cornwall, another sort of you know, really small regional town. And he's, what's great about his Instagrams, he's got very clear pictures. They're all done on a good background. They're all done on his phone. So that's something anyone can do. Exactly. Any business could do that. We, yeah. The phones these days have got better cameras than we ever had. Definitely. And yeah. what's super important, I think, for people is to have really at proper, um, proper descriptions of what the food is. If they can read that it is, you know, corner skate with you know brown butter, or you know, like I said, you know, Scottish scallops landed with whatever your garnish is, and be really specific about it, give as much people information as possible, I think that's really important. And also how often you, you upload. I think daily is, is, is hard, but it's definitely worth doing. If you can do it two or three times a week and keep people excited, that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's big. Mm-hmm. It's about creating hype. Yeah. It's about creating hype and creating a new, a, um, a new visual uh, illustration of what you experience. Yes, you're doing, exactly. Yeah. Karina, um, how do you use your, your website and, and social media to tell the story of your food? How do you do that? Um, Jenny, who works with me, who was um, who used to run the event side of things, and then she 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 was getting more and more excited about how do we communicate the message. Mm-hmm. So she no formal training in marketing, but she holds all of our marketing. She does a brilliant job. Um, so between Jenny and I, we share it. Um, so. Facebook is a massive contributor for us. Um, our blog posts, so we'll do, we try and do a weekly blog, blog post or a sort of fortnightly blog post and we'll, we'll talk about something that's quite sometimes controversial because I, th- I think, I, I mean, as I said, we employ 130 people. We're en- engaging with hundreds of suppliers and you know the impact that we're having on the community and the wider community, I feel, is, I feel a responsibility to make sure we're buying the be- making the best purchase that has the best impact because there mm-hmm. is that ripple effect, you know, it is affecting people's lives. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I think we've got a responsibility to say things that maybe are um, a wee bit controversial, you know, get people to think about what choices they're making. Mm-hmm. Um, so a, our blog post does that and that's through LinkedIn channels or through our website, um, you know, TripAdvisor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is actually something that we used to hate, we used to 
you know, we were, we were rude about TripAdvisor. But actually, you know, I think understanding, once you've got your customer journey in place and once you've understood your product and your team and your customer and they're all aligned, then TripAdvisor actually should be telling you that you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And if you've made a mistake, actually TripAdvisor can be there to tell you you've made a mistake. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a hundred, you know, there are some people that are maybe not genuine, but I think the majority of it, you know, as a social media channel, is yeah. genuine. Yeah. So well, we it's are important to talk to your customer through, through TripAdvisor as well. In all these ways, so online, in person, you're conveying that passion yeah. and the importance of the provenance and the, the story of the food. Well, we are running out of time now. Um, and before we wrap up, I'm just wondering, Al, that we did have some examples of some um, some websites uh, for some some Scottish businesses that are really doing a great job. Um, that I just wanted to show for you just now, um, Al, if we can do that. That the, they were ones that had been flagged up um, when we were talking about excellent food and drink offerings. We've got the Alapool Smokehouse. Um, I think we can show you uh, some of what they are doing. Again, great opportunities for globally for retail. Um, and uh, we've also got, you were talking there, um, Karina, about TripAdvisor, um, a small business doing really well, uh, Manuela's Wee Bakery. Um, who are just a very small business but creating a product that is just so so good that it's becoming a destination for people and becoming a highlight of their trip. So that's where food and drink um, and tourism really come together when you're creating an experience that's so special for people. Um, and as well as that, we've also got uh, the Isle of Sky Brewing Company um, who, who were a group of school teachers chatting in a pub one night about, you know, this, this lack of, um, of, of, of beer that they, you know, that they could get local and so they went and created it themselves and now you can see there um, they, they're doing a fantastic job of creating a product that is, you know, globally desired and, and they can really make the most of that and, the, uh, and connect in there as well with other businesses who can, who can uh, use, use that product in their food and drink offering. So finally, um, I just, I guess it's time to say, it's time say goodbye really Richard have we got any final thoughts there in the chat box um we have got lots of final thoughts in the chat box um we've got our friend Natalie is suggesting that Scottish people don't cook I think we kind of do cook um but it's just maybe not quite as well as the French um <laughs> and I'm desperately trying to keep up with you and I've posted links um to all of this uh, all of the sites that you've just said in the chat box and Audrey's here. Hi Audrey. She's telling people about locally sourced farmers markets in the Highlands where you can go and find these um, different types of food and it looks like Richard Jones and Richard T, Richard J and Richard T have hooked up and they're gonna they're swapping details with each other and gonna do a bit of sharing of best practice. So all very good. And I'm just gonna say don't forget that this will be made available. Are you doing all this stuff yeah. and you're right, Julia's gonna tell you all about <laughs> how you can watch this again in her outro. Uh, but thanks very much for getting involved and I um, look forward to seeing you all again uh, on our Facebook Live and next week. Uh, back to you, Julia. And that is very much what it's all about, collaborating, making those connections and working with other people. I think Karina uh, said that so beautifully earlier on. So many thanks to all our guests today, uh, to Sandra Reid from Fair Consulting, Karina Contini, Scott Fraser and to Gilly Bashan. And the full um, film from our chat with Gilly will be going up on the High YouTube channel as well. So you'll be able to see all of that on there. This session itself will be available in full in HD, glorious HD. Um, on the Hi YouTube channel, which is youtube.com uh, forward slash HIE communications. Um, but we'll also send you out links in our email communications, but uh, you should be able to find that. Next week, we're going to be looking at the opportunity to ride the wave of cruise tourism. Cruise tourism. I got so excited about that pun, I couldn't actually get my words out. Uh, so please join us for that. That will be next Wednesday, the 14th of November at 10 a.m. again. Uh, there's still time to sign up. Just go to the Tune Into Tourism page on the High website. You can follow us on Facebook um, at Highlands and Islands Enterprise um, and also on Twitter at HIE Scotland. And for the next four weeks, we're going to be sharing highlights uh, from sessions like this as well, well as other films. Uh, and we'll be going live on Facebook every Tuesday to give you a uh, heads up about what's going on and share some more practical advice but for now thank you so much for taking part please do keep those conversations going and get in touch with us if you've got something to share through the Facebook page um, I've been Julia Sutherland and Richard Melvin is always wants to get the last one, one, more, so one, more. <laughs> one last thing from him just wanted to say we have definitely got the invite to the distillery oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> the there you go sorry Julia back to you
that was that was worth interrupting me for. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for just now. As I said, keep an eye out on Facebook and on Twitter, and we will see you again next week. Goodbye. <laughs>